Yong Chul Yu, also known as the Raincoat Killer, due to his predilection for wearing a raincoat as he committed his messy murders, claimed the lives of at least 20 known victims in his terrifying tenure in the early 2000s. This man, thought of by many as a monster, held captive the innocent citizens of South Korea as he meticulously and ruthlessly barreled his way through the residences of South Korea, brutally killing random and innocent victims in his wake. Chul was born April 18, 1970, in Gohan, Seongbo, in South Korea. His family was quite poor and lived with very little resources. His father was an alcoholic and would abuse his family on a daily basis. A Vietnam War veteran, Yu's father was granted a large bonus after his wartime injury, but to the dismay of his family, he would go on to gamble it away. When Yu was eight years old, his parents would separate and his mother would eventually drop Yu and his siblings at his grandmother's home and then walk away from her own flesh and blood, leaving his grandmother to raise and take care of them. Eventually, his father would take Yu and his siblings with him to live with his new wife. Yu's new stepmother was violent towards him and his siblings. The family struggled financially and lived in an area which had very limited water and inconsistent electricity. Because of his visible poverty, Yu was bullied throughout his school attendance. And while he found solace in drawing and singing, his adolescence was further stunted by the death of his father, who died in 1985 in a traffic accident. Not wanting to become like his father, Yu decided to study hard and become an artist. He applied for admission into Anyang Arts High School. However, due to low grades and his financial status, he was rejected. As a consequence of these schoolyard traumas, rejections, and the poverty with which he was brought up, he developed a deep-seated hatred for the wealthy. Failing to get into a program that would make him on track for a bachelor's degree in arts, he enrolled into a technical school in 1987. During his school years, he began his life of crime. In 1988, at the age of 18, he stole a guitar and a Sony tape recorder from a wealthy neighbor. He was caught and sent to a juvenile detention center. As a result, he could not complete his technical high school. After his first arrest for petty theft in 1988, Yu escalated rapidly into stealing larger and more expensive items, from cash to cameras to cars. In 1991, he met a masseuse named Huang Mo, and both started dating. He would later marry her and have a son with her. On June 23, 1999, he stole a camera and $500 from his landlord. He was caught and sentenced to 10 months in prison. After his release, he stayed clean, but in 1994, he decided to steal a car. He was again caught and had to spend eight months in prison. After his subsequent release, he suffered from epilepsy and was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for bipolar disorder. He was released from that hospital in 1995. In 1995, you changed his criminal status from that of a thief to that of a monster when he was caught distributing illegal pornography images and videos involving minors. It is unclear how long he was sentenced for this heinous act, but in 1998, he was free to again roam the streets and committed more thefts. He also impersonated a police officer and for that he was remanded to prison for two years. In the year 2000, Yu was again arrested and his predilection for the illegally young was demonstrated as he was proven to have raped a 15-year-old. For this crime, he was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Until now, his wife had tolerated his behavior, but after this arrest, she divorced him, citing abuse and alcoholism in the filing as the main issue leading to their separation. 
Unsurprisingly, after his short prison sentence, there was no improvement in Yu's criminal predilections. While incarcerated, his hatred towards the rich and privileged only grew stronger. He believed that the rich were the main culprits for the hardships and misery that the poor have had to endure, and he wanted to murder them all. While in his cell, Yu read and studied an article about a serial killer named Chong Ju Yong, who had murdered nine wealthy people in the Kungnam province from 1999 to 2000. Some wonder if the consumption of such violent and specific media while incarcerated for violent crimes had inspired his own future reign of terror. In prison, he also developed a hatred towards women after his wife left him. He wanted revenge on his wife and his son and formulated a plan to kill them both. He was later quoted as saying, in a succinct summation of his beliefs, quote, Women should not be sluts, and the rich should know what they have done. Yu was released from prison for the rape of the 15-year-old in September of 2003. After being set free with inadequate supervision, Yu lived with his mother in Seoul. His wife acquiesced to allow Yu, at his request, to see his child. Unbeknownst to her, he was a danger to both his wife and his son as he was planning on killing them. However, Yu said that upon seeing the eyes of his son, he was forced by his better, and some say perhaps his biological, judgment to change his mind about committing infanticide. After making this moral decision, Yu decided to just kill his wife. But even then, he was not able to actually commit the murder due to the familiarity. This was the last time that Yu would be allowed to see his ex-wife and his only child. Because of this murderous deficiency of Yu's inability to kill those he loved or to whom he felt intimate feelings, many theorize that Yu found surrogates and his subsequent victims unknown to him and thus easier to kill without remorse. It is at this point that he decided to get his revenge on the wealthy. But first, he needed to practice as he had never killed a person before. So he started experimenting with killing dogs. He would take the dogs to a secluded area and kill them with a hammer that he himself had built. He later decided to target older wealthy people as he thought they would be easier to kill. Yu would be free for less than two weeks before escalating in his illegal activity choice and upping the brutality with which he engaged in it. On the morning of September 24th, 2003, Yu left his home carrying a pair of gloves, a 15 centimeter long knife, and a hammer. He went to Shin Sedong, Kamnonggu, Seoul. Shin Sedong was one of the wealthiest districts in Seoul. After reaching the district, he walked through the street, scouring the area, looking at all the houses, trying to find a home without any surveillance. After walking around for a bit, he saw an old man getting out of his car and entering his house. He looked around the house and jumped the garden wall. The house belonged to a retired university professor and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Lee. Yu forced his way into the house and entered the living room. He there found 70-year-old Professor Lee sitting on the couch. Upon seeing the intruder, Lee panicked and started shouting. Yu immediately stabbed him in the neck. You then bludgeoned his wife with the hammer that he had brought. He finished off the professor with multiple blows to his head. You then cleaned everything up so as not to leave any evidence. He then locked the front door and exited through the main gate. However, just as he was leaving, he realized he had forgotten his knife in the house. He climbed the wall again and kicked the door open. He took the knife and staged the homeowners as having experienced a botched robbery. He trashed the place, but made a key and somewhat inexplicable error in forgetting to actually steal anything, thus tipping off to police that this was not the work of a panicked thief, but that of a brutal yet somewhat disorganized killer. It is thought that there are two distinct types of serial killers, organized and disorganized. According to the FBI, an organized killer is defined as a quote, individual who planned his murders and displayed control at the time of the scene whereas a disorganized killer has the characteristics of spontaneity, and according to the FBI, quote, their crime scenes appeared more muddled and the crimes were more opportunistic in nature. Yu is described as disorganized due to his lack of foresight. Around two weeks later, on October 9, 2003, Yu struck again when he broke into the home of a multi-generational family in Koi Tong, Seoul. 
You first smashed the skull of the homeowner's mother, King Mo, whose screams then alerted the homeowner's wife to the fact that her mother-in-law was in trouble. She rushed down the stairs to assist and was met with her own savage death at the hands of Yu, but not before he kicked her in the stomach, demanding that she tell him if any other occupants were in the home. She, terrified, told him that her husband, along with their disabled son, were upstairs. After that, he killed her with a hammer and moved on to her disabled son. The son was also killed by bludgeoning with a hammer, after being forced to kneel execution style. The husband, not actually home, had not even the chance to defend his wife, son, or mother, and would later uncover the brutal truth upon returning home. Police found a partial shoe print at the crime scene, however, it did not match any of the other family members. One week later, on October 16th, millionaires Zhu He Yu was attacked by Yu in Samsung Dong, Seoul, when he broke in and demanded that she tell him of the whereabouts of the home's occupants. When she admitted that she was home alone, he dragged her to the bathroom and beat her within inches of her life with a hammer. When her son later returned home, he found her, but she later succumbed to her injuries. Police were able to find footprints at this crime scene too. The footprints matched the prints found at the Koi Tong crime scene. The media started linking the three murder cases together, however, police denied it as they did not want the public to panic. One month later, on November 18th, housekeeper Chi Hai Pei was accosted in the home that she was working in, in Hayu Tong, Seoul. Yu, who had broken in, demanded she tell him the location of the master bedroom. A consummate professional, she politely inquired as to his identity and purpose for being inside. He took out a knife and told her to take him to the bedroom. In the bedroom, he found the homeowner, Yong Suk Kim, and a one-year-old baby lying in bed. You immediately took out his hammer and bludgeoned Kim to death. The panicked housekeeper took the baby and tried to run, but you snatched the crying baby away and took him to the living room where he wrapped him in a blanket to muffle his screams. He then went back to the bedroom and bludgeoned the housekeeper. He trashed the place to make it look like a robbery and tried to open the safe but got a cut on his finger. In order to leave no DNA evidence, he set the house on fire. However, this time a surveillance camera caught him leaving the house. He was wearing one of the jackets from the victim's home, possibly to hide the blood on his clothing. The video captured him from the back, so it was impossible to identify him. The one-year-old baby survived and was taken to the hospital. The police made the footage public in hopes of anyone being able to provide any clues, but to no avail. After this, Yu would take some time off from killing. He forged a fake police ID and went to the red light district to extort money from sex workers and pimps, as prostitution is illegal in South Korea. He was also able to accumulate about $4,000 and rented an apartment. He was a regular customer of the sex services in the area, and at the end of November, he met an escort named Kim. Both would soon start dating, and within two months, he'd proposed to her. However, Kim found out about Yu's criminal past and rejected him. She left him and told him not to contact her anymore. The rejection ignited a new hatred, this time towards women who worked as sex workers. He now decided to target them in his murderous intent. In January of 2003, Yu was arrested for robbery, but was released shortly after. On March 16, 2003, he called an escort service and told them to send one of their girls to meet him at the Sade Mungu shopping mall. He took her to his apartment, and after having sex with her, Yu dragged her to the bathroom and bludgeoned her to death. Since his apartment was on the third floor, he could not carry the body down to dispose of it, as he would surely be seen. So, he dismembered her body into 18 pieces and put them into several plastic bags. He also put kimchi in the bags to mask the smell. He buried her body on a small mountain behind the Sogong University. Since the area was small, he marked the burial site with a bottle cap so that he would not accidentally dig it up again for when he needed to use the area to bury more victims in the future. In early April, Yu bought Viagra from Pak Song Plaza Pharmacy. However, the owner had actually sold him fake Viagra. This angered Yu, and he returned to the place on the 13th of April, posing as a police officer. He found the owner of the pharmacy, Ji Sonan, who was heading towards his van. 
you decided to extort money from him over the selling of fake medicine. You showed him his fake police ID. However, since Ahn had had several run-ins with the law, he immediately recognized his ID to be fake. He told him that he would go to the police station with him to verify it if he wished to continue threatening him. You, realizing that he could get caught, decided to kill him instead. He handcuffed the pharmacy owner and shoved him into his own van. You then drove the pharmacy owner's van back to Yu's own apartment to get his murder weapon of choice, the hammer, the knife, as well as the gloves. He then drove to a nearby underground parking lot and stabbed and bludgeoned on to death. However, in the process, he got a cut on his hands. Knowing that he could not leave any DNA evidence behind, he decided to attempt to set the crime scene on fire. But he knew he could not do it near his apartment without catching the attention of authorities. So he walked to his apartment, cleaned himself up, and then drove the van to Wilmito Island. He cut off the victim's hands and put them and the handcuffs in a plastic bag and threw them into the sea. He did this so that police could not identify the body. He then doused the van with gasoline and set it on fire. In April, you called another escort service and asked them to send a girl to meet him in front of the SK Telecom next to the Green Theater in Nokosong Tong. He took her to his apartment, had sex with her, and then bludgeoned her to death. He then dismembered her body and disposed of it at the mountain behind the Sogong University. He would go on to murder eight women between April and July in his apartment with the same modus operandi. Because sex workers often lived alone and without any contact with their family or friends, their disappearances would often go unnoticed. Even the police would turn a blind eye. The escort service owners would not report the escorts missing as that would get them in trouble with police. This was the main reason that no one cared enough to report the girls as endangered or missing. You would call the escort service agency under different names and phone numbers so as not to get caught. It wouldn't be until one of the escort service owners started noticing his girls disappearing that it would become painfully clear something was wrong. On July 15, 2004, you called the escort service again using a different name and phone number and asked for an escort. However, the owner recognized the phone number as having belonged to one of the previous girls that went missing. Suspicious that the person on the phone was abducting the girls, he reported it to police. The police then worked with the owner and asked a woman to act as bait. The woman then took a taxi and went to the small park near Honggyok University where Yu had asked her to meet him. The police followed her closely. The woman reached the location and waited for Yu. Yu then suddenly called her and told her to go back. Yu told her that she was too tall. Apparently, Yu would only target women who were shorter and easier to overpower and dismember. If the woman was not his preferred size, he would let her go. Yu then called the owner again and asked for a new girl. He told her to meet him this time in an alleyway. The police and the owner of the escort service arranged for a new girl and sent her to the location. After waiting for a bit, Yu finally showed up. The girl then immediately called the police and the owner who were standing nearby. Yu was caught and handcuffed. At the time, police thought Yu was a thief or a kidnapper who was abducting the sex workers. They had no idea the criminal they had in their midst. Yu was taken to the Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency for interrogation. In the interrogation room, the detective asked him, quote, where did you sell them? To which you replied, if it's a kidnapping case, it's not me. The detective then said, then what are you? To which you replied, me? I killed people. Those four murders, I killed those old bags. The detective thought that you was joking, so he smacked him. You then asked the detective to give him a notepad and started drawing tally marks. He drew 26 tally marks. The detective then asked him what his marks represented, to which he replied, that's how many people I have killed. He then told the detective that he was willing to confess to his mother. The police then brought in his mother and you told her, quote, I've killed a lot of people and that is why I'm here. Upon hearing this, his mother fainted and she had to be taken to the hospital. The police then took him to Koi Jong and asked him to show them the house where he killed the people from one of the crime scenes in order to verify his claims. 
Yu, it seems, then intentionally took the police to the wrong house. He also intentionally gave wrong details, like that the daughter was laying face up when she died, when in fact she was laying face down when her body was found. Police believe that maybe Yu was not a killer, but simply a mentally disturbed man, so they let their guard down. He was taken back to Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency for further questioning. Upon reaching the interrogation room, Yu faked an epileptic fit. The detective immediately removed his handcuffs and sat him down on the chair. The detective then went to leave the room while an officer stayed in the room with Yu. While the detective was leaving, however, Yu followed him right behind. The other officer, thinking that the detective was taking Yu to another room, did not question the action. Yu then ran down the corridor, down the stairs, and out of the building. After he escaped, Yu then went to his mother's house and cleaned up. He then picked up the hammer, the knife, the gloves, and the bag that was seen in the CCTV footage and threw them in dumpsters around the city. The police went to his apartment, but found out that the address on his ID was incorrect. Police combed through the streets searching for him, but to no avail. Then, 12 hours later, a police officer saw Yu crossing the street at the Yongdongpo station. He was captured and brought in for interrogation, yet again. He confessed to murdering 26 people. He drew maps of the four murder cases committed in the wealthy neighborhood and gave details about the crime scenes that were not known to the general public. He then took detectives to the burial site behind Sogong University and told them that he had marked the burial sites with bottle caps. To the shock and horror of everyone present at the scene, the police would dig up 18 bodies from the burial site. Yu also claimed to have eaten the livers of four of his victims. However, this has never been confirmed. On September 6, 2004, Yu appeared in court and apologized to the families and friends of victims, but said he had no intention of stopping. He also confessed to the murder of a 25-year-old woman in Imundong Tongda Mangu. However, he later retracted his confession for this particular murder, saying he had been coerced by the police on the premise that they would send his son to university. He admitted in court that the only time he felt horrified with his own actions was when he was dismembering one of the victims and his son had called him. Yu recalls that his son said to him, quote, Daddy, do you still have a cold? Yu said that it felt like his son was saying to him, quote, I know everything, don't do that. Yu said that after that call, he couldn't dismember the body, so he ate ramen. In his second appearance in court, Yu jumped over the railing and lunged towards three judges. However, he slipped, giving just enough time for police officers to pin him down. On October 4, 2004, Yu tried to commit suicide in his cell by hanging, but police officers stopped him. On October 25, 2004, he attacked a spectator in court after he insulted him. He was stopped by police and was made to sign a statement in which he was asked not to cause any further disruptions in the trial. On December 13, 2004, Yu was found guilty for the murder of 20 people and sentenced to death. The Supreme Court upheld his death penalty in 2005. He is currently incarcerated at the Seoul Detention Center.